What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and it's my continuing loading screen dialogue to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Today, we're taking a look at Anthem by Bioware, published by EA and looked forward to by lovers of big mech battles for about six years. A game that's been said to be a single open world action adventure RPG since pretty much its inception. Let's see if it actually is. Let's also see if it's fun. It's out now for EA Premier and Basic members and out for others on February 22nd. And as you guys know, if someone asks for cash, their product gets a review. Life isn't a charity. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Anthem, Return of the Looter Scooter Shooter, proof that more people need to have a dictionary and detailed dialogue options not deemed discussion worthy. As always, graphics are up first. And where do I begin? First, when you leap into the game world and start walking around, Tarsus actually looks pretty cool as a starting base. Nothing like the living, breathing world of the trailer, that's for sure, but it's sort of cool, a lived-in, unique location with an awesome setup. It can be tough to figure out how to get to particular places, though, make no mistake. This can be confounded by different missions really being spread around the game world in different locations, many of them circular, which causes you to waste a bit of time moving around the place. It's a solitary location for sure, but later you do get a social hangar that you can actually visit as well, which looks okay. Tarsus is really a mixture of old-style market bazaars, labyrinthian architecture, and a love for hanging drapes. I sort of liked the overall design, at least at first. Then you jump into the game world. Now, one thing Anthem does right was handle the verticality, and that matters because you're in flying mechs. It'd be a little weird if they didn't, but I like it here with the world having an almost Neotech World of Warcraft Thousand Needles designed to it that's somewhat explorable in the free play moments that you have. With various bits and pieces of the ancient civilizations all marked around the locations, it actually looks quite good, especially with wind effects rolling up and blowing debris all around you. But once again, verticality is absolutely where it is here, from hovering to just finding cover above enemies to them using it against you. It's easily the best example of how to use that kind of element in a game correctly. And definitely, Anthem stands out in that department. Flying around the game world, you sometimes see flocks of alien birds or strange creatures roaming the land. It's no Monster Hunter with its teeming wildlife Marlon Perkins wet dream kind of moments, but it does well to flesh out the locations, if only a little bit. However, the best moments in Anthem are, of course, the battle. That's where it shines. For example, I actually love the special effects, the particle systems, and overlapping damage types that the game has to offer. It's hard not to smile the first time you combo with another javelin and take down some heavy armor damage soaker in one-fourth the time it would have originally taken. Or the Robotech moment that the ranger unleashes their missile barrage special, and the missiles just sort of fly out lazily with no real directional sense and then unerringly hawk either way directly into the domes of a bunch of unsuspecting drone workers. Or the crackle and crystal bits falling off an enemy frozen to the ground from an ice weapon. And the excellent effects of friends and foe alike when they go all Elon Musk on people and start burning the world down with what has to look like the most unsafe flamethrower known to man. Jump into the javelins themselves for a second. Every single one of us has always wanted to know what it would be like leaping into these things. And I can say that each one does look a bit different with the electricity laden storm really having a unique look compared to the Ranger or the cheaply made fake Hulkbuster known as the Colossus. But not as unique as it probably should be for just four overall suits. Some of that is mitigated by a number of options for vinyls, armor pieces, and so forth. And you can absolutely make some cool looking characters. And animation is pretty good for a game of this kind. For a moment, let's talk about the enemies, though, and let's be clear, they are dudes you're going to be fighting that are B-level enemies in the Marvel movies. Many of the times you're flying around and they have like two or three enemy types that can keep up with you, but you're in the air and you're up there hovering around raining death into their faces as they scream at you to come down and fight them street level like Black Widow. Luckily, there are a couple flying units in each group, but not as many as you would assume, especially for a race who knew that they'd be fighting off a bunch of armored birds. But that doesn't stop the wickedness of the fire effects or the shield effects or the sheer balls to the walls excellence of fighting some giant spider alien thing with its ass glowing like a 5,000 lumen YouTuber glamour light in the dark of some cavern somewhere. Explosions, effects, particle systems. That's where Anthem absolutely shines, even if it can be a bit confusing when you're new to the game. And I absolutely have to say, launching out the Rangers' impact missiles once again in that thunderous explosion is probably something that's never going to get old. But it does take very little time for you to start noticing all the issues in Anthem. First, you start to see things like entire buildings and structures with signs and habitation with nothing actually in them living. Lights are on, torches lit, and yet not a single person is walking around. It's like an entire town went on vacation and forgot to turn the fucking lights off. 
Also, once you see one open area, you sort of feel like you've seen them all. There are some adjustments in the ecosystem, but it's nowhere near the more robust settings of Destiny's locations, and that's even in the later game moments. Some dungeon areas certainly do look cool, but after the second time, or maybe the third time, you're going to realize two different things. One, most of it looks the same. And two, you can tell atmospherically where almost any battle, story element, or unique situation is going to occur. And I mean that literally. You can tell every time. Surprises muted by poor environmental level design choice in a lot of places. There are vast swaths of land that can't really be used by the enemies. And you can tell by its simple design that the lack of enemies being able to be there means that you really won't ever have an experience in that location. Sure, there are small dungeon encounters and free roam filled with enemies and crafting materials for you to gather. But once you know that they're there, there isn't really much else to see. It's a barren wasteland covered over the top with some fancy broken stuff. And here's where we get to the sort of it's not me, it's you moment of the graphical breakdown or breakup. First, the weapon design is horrifyingly basic. This means that the later weapons as well just don't look that good. And we got to see a lot of those in the VIP beta. I mean, it's like three kids in a playpen breaking down recycled cardboard boxes and then gluing cheap plumbing parts to them and calling them guns. And I've had more than one person tell me, well, that's because it's a third person game. You shouldn't care. Yeah, it's a looter scooter shooter where the company makes you want to care by having those items actually noticeable and part of the mission rewards. And it makes a huge deal about them. So they for sure want you to care whether you do. It's like finishing last in a fucking race you trained nine months for and then saying, well, you know what? I really didn't care at all, but only saying that once you've lost. Now, that's not to say that all the weapons look bad. Some of them have a very robust, almost industrial feeling to them that I like, and we got to see in the beta some of the later weapons. But in the end, it's a little bit like stapling a gold ribbon to a turd. I'm probably not going to want to hold it in my hands for very long. Now, when it comes to texture work and different elements like that, I actually think Anthem looks pretty good. When it comes to the character modeling of the NPC humans, not so much. Their faces are ironed of most detail work, and they always look a bit like some kind of sentient mannequin that's learned how to talk. But all this good and this bad wouldn't matter if the performance wasn't there. So let's discuss it. I have to say, easily, compared to the beta, I'm absolutely happy with how it runs on my PC. Now remember, I can only speak for me. I know some folks are getting crashes or issues, and I can only say I'm running at 4K minimum 60 FPS with a 2080 Ti and a current i7, with a couple drops in the main city, but locked in battles. There's actually not a lot of current games that can get 4K 60 FPS in current titles, and I have to give them kudos for that. That's a measure of the top end, though. But if you've got more of a normal system, like a 1080 or a 1070 with a current i7, you're probably going to be able to hit 60 FPS at 1080p or even 1440p with some adjusted visual settings, of which there's actually a nice number to choose from and adjust. As always, Shadows, Ambient Occlusion, and a couple others hit the FPS pretty hard, so I would say start there when adjusting to get more frames. Also, I gotta talk a little bit about load times. Even after the patch, they can be atrocious. If you run on an SSD, load times run anywhere from a minute to two minutes, with something odd occurring later on in the game, and that's that the loads get longer and longer and longer. Now, this is mitigated in some way with M2 memory, lowering those load times to maybe 45 seconds, but those are also not immune to the crazy loading times crawling up higher and higher in the timing chain as you continue to play. Whether that's a memory leak or the sign of some other situation occurring inside this engine, I'm not aware. But what about the consoles? Now, while the game is on full release, now in Premiere and in EA Access on Xbox, the PS4 version isn't out till tomorrow, so I can't speak on that. As for the Xbox system, sadly, yesterday's patch seemed to break HDR completely. This issue's been reported, and it is said they're working on it. However, it does run better after the patch. It still does have some rough spots where it drops below 30 FPS in the big firefights. The Xbox original looks a bit soft, and I don't think it's hitting 1080p, but I wasn't able to count resolution. I'll leave that up to somebody else. It also has a couple issues hitting 30 FPS for sure. As a package, the game can look good for sure. The particle effects, the explosive moments, the four javelins all racing to combo in on some big boss or flyway as they get lit on fire. That stuff is where Anthem is at its best, that and just exploring for the first or second time. Once that time has passed, it's easy to start noticing the lack of any impact you make on the world in any way, doing no real damage to anything, despite each server only having four people in it, as well as the lack of enemy diversity and some other issues I'm going to mention later. I would say, overall, moments of brilliance, but mostly just mediocre. Sound, music, and voice.
silent, the Koroks has a new friend, then we come out all right. Starting to see where you got the nickname. It could have gone straight sideways, I'm telling you, but that's what family's for. Stronger together, right? It's the best way to survive. Nice to have company, too. More eyes, more ears. And we're going to do sound first. While typically very subdued, especially within the city locations, once you get out and about, it's actually got a nice rising battle score that has a mix of older, more classical elements with an almost Mass Effect vibe to it and some crunchy synth at times. And I really liked it. It didn't get in the way too much, but it added a bit of excitement to some of the encounters. Though I did find at places it triggered prior to enemies coming out of the woodwork, which did make it feel a bit odd and certainly did remove a little bit of the narrative poignancy. And of course, that brings us to sound. This is actually very good, or at least it was prior to the patch that just came out. I had none of the issues that others were having. The impact of the wrist-mounted rocket slamming home and turning enemies' insides into outsides was fantastic, as well as the unnerving whoosh of sound of an enemy flamethrower just on the other side of a set of rocks. I love that. Sadly, once it's patched, and even with the reinstall, I started to have the same bugs as everyone else, with sounds dropping out during battle all the time. This is especially noticeable with the special weapons and attacks. They're just not playing. Also, I have to say, regardless of the audio settings I chose, of which there really isn't that many, mostly just stereo and surround and then some presets, the directional audio worked well, but its lack of Atmos support is almost damning. In a game with this much verticality and the loss of extra fidelity from not having it, height in the game just really isn't translated to the gamer, and that sucks. When it's running well, I dug the sounds a great deal in Anthem. In fact, it was one of my favorite parts, despite Atmos not being supported. And of course, that brings us to voice. And man, this is not up to standards. This is sleepy time. It's like everybody took a bunch of Ambien and then just leaned up against something so you could talk to them. It isn't up to Bioware standards, that's for sure. With everyone from the main baddie you see traipsing around in a size 3 baby feet, by the way, go check that cutscene out to the NPCs that stand around in the main city. They don't really have any emotion or gravitas to them at all. In fact, it could have been played well had it been vocalized either way. But overall, what you have is a huge number of NPCs just standing there asking what you're doing and telling you what you should do, but sounding like they want to do anything but that. In fact, it's one of the first instances where it sounds like voice actors are legitimately sleepy when talking. And that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. You start as a javelin pilot at Fort Tarsus and begin a journey into a story of competing factions all fighting over the same bit of land, exploring the world in your javelin, going back home sometimes to turn in missions and get new ones, upgrading your suits as well as your weapons and guns, and then going back out again to basically trigger another cutscene about a main bad guy. If you expect something deeper from the story, it's not here. There's no subtlety. The atypical Bioware excellence in storytelling took a hit with Dragon Age Inquisition, took a kick in the nuts in Andromeda, and somehow here was still on the ground and someone just came over and slowly nudged him off a cliff into the black abyss of suck. To say the story's disappointing in a game like this isn't really normally that damning, but in one way it's Bioware's credentials, credentials that they themselves laud as impacting the game and not being anywhere to be seen is sad as hell and quite noticeable. Luckily, you usually leave all this behind and you jump in your javelin and go and do a variety of basic missions to accomplish, from simple gathering types to excellent strongholds to random drop-ins on other people's games if they're missing a player, to story-based missions delivered by NPCs. You start with the choice to pick one of four javelins, each with its unique sticking point, up close and quick killer of enemies with powerful attacks, the Interceptor, to the Colossus, who's a tanky character that moves like a sloth who just smoked about 40 bales of weed and then someone who should never be in charge of safety decided to attach a friggin' flamethrower to him. A middle range, good for all occasions, but great for none, average javelin, coincidentally called Ranger, and the equivalent of a magic user javelin known as Storm that can rain down the very power of Anthem on enemies, but can't defend itself worth a hot shit in a desert trench. Each of these can have weapons you can craft or find in battle, as well as various armor components, larger timed use weapons, and secondary weapons. Crafting requires items you can find in the field, you can buy for coins from playing the game, or buy with microtransactions. Armor can be bought when you find the right plans, as well as bought with microtransactions or gold in the game as well. Now, many of the Javelin's locations have multiple slots on them that you can open up as you upgrade in your level, 8, 14, 18, and 23. 
These range from extra ammo compartments to armor to extra boosters for thrust to just extra booster overall, impact, main weapons, or friendly damage all being increased. I like this system as there is an incredible amount of subtlety that can be put on display here. For example, while the Colossus is a big, rumbling, stumbling, bumbling, bipedal Abrams battle tank, you can treat it as that, or you could also offset it with a sniper rifle, some ammo docks, and increased armor. And then, while taking pot shots at enemies, use its special battle cry support item that makes enemies run towards him, and you can pick them off as they do. You can't fully overlap one another with the javelins. I would have loved at least maybe, say, eight for some flexibility here. But I'd be lying if I didn't say it was enjoyable to go into different groups and even singly and see how everything works together, especially with those combo enhancers that worked quite well if you understand how to use them. I may not love the shooting at all times, but overall the control of the javelins is nailed down with each having their own special ability and use in battle, the ability to hover, shield themselves, and so forth. It works just right, and the control, once I fiddled a bit with the sensitivity, felt perfect during gunplay. It was an absolute blast when shooting through the enemies in front of you, using the scoot dodge to flip out of the angle of an enemy, double jump into the sky, and then rain down an entire Iron Man worth of ordnance on their heads, sending them to hell, not only in a handbasket, but lightly cooked to perfection. And this is a game where you can really feel this. You can feel the combination between weapons and javelins creating this excellent synergy. And depending on particular javelin setups, not only do they matter, but team-ups matter as well. For instance, just depending on the situation, a Colossus Juggernaut can be a difference between a nice even flow battle with a leveled risk versus reward element to it to a complete damn destruction laced death fest as you find yourself inside battle areas too small to really effectively use some of the other javelin strengths. Also, most of the guns work very well overall. For a title like this, all things considered, the control's snappy and satisfying to me. Now, when it comes to the control flying and swimming, less so. Flying has really been a learned skill, and I think it's better. Swimming never felt right, but luckily, you don't find yourself doing it a ton. But when it comes to flying, there's one giant caveat, and that's that you have the worst dynamic I've ever seen set up, which is during normal flight, your mechs can overheat. Now, this seems odd because within the battles, all this makes a lot of sense. You have enemies that can overheat you and drop you from the sky, resulting in you needing to change up your gameplay. Sure, you can cool off your mech in free flight by aiming straight down and soaring towards the ground or cooling off by flying over water. But in the end, it's like giving you a piece of candy, then letting you chew it for four seconds before you're forced to spit it back out again. It makes no real sense in the game and really is one more way in which it slows it down. And that's when you begin to notice all the strange inconveniences that are in Anthem that aren't in a lot of other games. It's a DMV line for a DMV line that ends up leading to a TSA flight check line before you go to the good stuff. Also, strangely enough, you cannot change your equipment mid-mission, ever. That's right, with all the flying and losing abilities for flying, then getting back up and then watching a two-minute cutscene, then jumping into a minute-long load. They don't figure out a way for you to change weapons for what you get when you're in the mission. But the killing blow to me in Anthem, and to most games of this type, is the enemy AI, and Anthem's is stunningly bad, especially for the Scar enemies. For example, even on the harder difficulties, almost none of them showed any kind of advanced AI, and by advanced, I actually should just be saying flanking or dodging or rolling or flying away or any number of other basic AI routines that have been shown for games six or seven years ago, let alone current ones. The only enemies that pose any kind of interesting challenge are a couple shield-bearing brutes that bloodhound you through a level and require expertise in getting behind so you don't waste your ultimate attack on the massive protected front that they have, and the occasional sniper that warps in. Worst yet, they failed all three tests for group awareness, meaning other than sound checks for the gunfire, they really do seem oblivious to all other battlefield situations. If they are aware, they are simply the stupidest enemies in a game of this kind in years. And countless times, whether alone or in groups, we'd be dropped into battle and the enemies just sort of stand there as you whittle away at the souls of their best friends and either they never attack or sort of meander around like they can't figure out why their continued killing of civilians and overall destructive behavior is called down a four-party team of metal-clad death angels from the sky. This happens with the Scar enemies in particular and happens both pre- and post-patch. Now, this results in that damning issue for Anthem I talked about. The design has to be the most truncated I've seen in a game of this type. The missions are short, even the somewhat long ones. None of them are that exciting. The AI is not at all a real challenge other than death soaks. And for the most part, you're fighting for things you can't even see. So the sense of reward is completely muted. Each of these moments is bookended by an incredible number of loading screens and tethering that post-patch still 
teleports you to the group regardless if you're less than 50 feet away and never really lets Anthem get going and show its strengths. See, that's the issue here. Anthem can and sometimes does get going. It could have had amazing, full lengthy, drawn out experiences because they seem to be able to be there in place, but it never turns out that way. And the game's strongest content is sadly its least utilized one, which is the strongholds. You see, when we look at types of games like this, they all deliver a different overall style. And it's not necessarily like some games don't have some of the same weaknesses. But what goes on with Anthem is that those weaknesses are there, but it is also packed within these incredibly small moments of, well, really fun anarchy at times, but they are so small that it's hard to even get going. It's hard to even get the full emotional spectrum of the title before something happens to slow everything back down. And of course, speaking of length for a game, the first six to eight hours, I absolutely think that people can have a good time if you don't run into the frankly haunting number of bugs that users are experiencing right now. The game has none of the longevity, both service games as well as some free games actually have. Half-baked is a good term, either for the game's current status or the creators who were making it. And that brings us to Fun Factor. I would absolutely be lying if I didn't say that there were moments of fun here for sure. And I can see that people are having fun who are talking about it and playing the full version out there right now. They are really enjoying different elements of it. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to last very long. And it certainly didn't for anyone I know. And it definitely didn't for me. It's a game that when the synergy of the characters is moving perfectly together, it can feel absolutely incredible. But unfortunately, it's bookended by a ton of issues that crop up and that includes the fact that the ui really is not that good when you're inside of the character sheet and looking at the different things in fact some of the stats are just frankly missing there were some misspellings here and there it just feels very odd as a title and it seems like it hurts itself more than it helps itself here's the thing that's scary they say it's the start of another 10-year adventure that's right the same dire words destiny used prior to bungie noping the fuck away from activision like michael douglas ran away from glenn close when she boiled his family's pet rabbit except here the game is undercooked. The worst and probably biggest issue is that much of the major problems cannot actually be patched away here, or at least very easily. And that's the problem. Five to 20 minute locations with loads to go home and almost no real good solid lengthy missions to speak of. Also, the tethering can stop you from picking up weapons that have dropped if you're in the middle of a battle and you end up getting tethered back to a different group. You can't go back and get the items that dropped. And even if you are doing those missions, you start to realize that it's infected by its own terrible gameplay loop of short, direlessly boring, repetitive missions. Go here, click on a box, save a glowing fairy globe from a cage somewhere, and then drop it at the foot of a 40 meter long MTX subwoofer to open a door, rinse and repeat. No, I'm not lying about any of that. That's actually in there. I will say though, again, the strongholds are easily the best missions, though really all they are are smaller missions put together into one single encounter, meaning that most strongholds feel identical to the other game mission types, uh, but just a little bit longer. Also, we know this took six years, and we know that at one point they stated publicly this was going to be the one big seamless world. Many times in many interviews they said this. Why is it that when that part of the technology failed, someone didn't actually tell us of that? I know it's a redundant question, we all know the answer, but it still sucks. As a package, I'd say there's a lot of fun to be had here by a certain subset of people, but overall, Anthem just wasn't ready for release, and is very far from it, in fact, especially when it comes from a group, a team like this with such a long heritage that people expected something better from. As you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touched again rating scale with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale if it's a PC title. I will say this, if you have Premiere, you can certainly get it for a small amount. You could get it on Redbox or Bluebox or Gamefly, but currently the game has so many issues technically. It has so many issues with its delivery and it does not actually deliver what they said it would deliver in many different ways that it feels like ultimately an incredible disappointment. And I just don't feel comfortable telling anybody to get it at anywhere near its normal price. So right now, if you've got Premiere, great. Any other way, I'd say don't touch it for now and maybe wait for a couple patches to see if it's at least more stable. It's a situation right now where it's a game as a service kind of title, but it is one that is so many steps below any others with the massive amount of bugs on console and PC alike. It's just absolutely stunning that it feels like they have not learned from these past six or seven years. And what we've got is something that feels old, creaky, and almost in many ways goes against the actual design decisions we've seen before and does something that makes it worse.
So anyway, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike the video, give it a thumbs down. As always, you can follow me on Twitch or Twitter or Facebook. I do a bunch of stuff on Twitch now. Feel free to go there. And when it comes down to it, you can become a patron on the Patreon website, which has one of the best damn discords for discussion. We put together games. We do a ton of stuff together. And it helps me continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And as always, I buy a copy of every single game I review and give it away to patrons. So my hard-earned money is on the line, just like yours. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.